who lives in probably one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Is it not? Here we are. I mean, I was outside today and I don't know about you guys, but it's hard to come inside to do the chat. Well, I guess it's not that difficult because these are great people, but we live in a great community. Uh, I'm just excited to be here tonight and to continue to explore how we can even together make Roner Park a safer place to live. So uh, we have some questions. And if, if some of you, by the way, this is the second time I've done this chat. And uh, we had just a great first chat and these have been ongoing. I understand, does anybody know the number of people that are kind of viewing this on a regular basis? Well, I know, I know that we're reaching, um, our, our Zooms have, have picked up in the numbers that are logging onto the Zoom. Um, and our Facebook Lives, uh, we're getting a, quite a reach and quite a view. But the, fun, the great thing about the Facebook Live is that people can go on later and, and view it again. So all week we're, we're watching people come on and a number seem to be getting, you know, getting better. And, uh, you know, that's what this is about is trying to reach as many people and give as many people the opportunity to, to call in or write in and, and, and just have a chat. It, it's, it's amazing to me, you know. I'm a pastor here in Rotor Park. I've been here for, oh my goodness, this is my 24th year of living here in the North Bay in Northern California. And there, there's a certain perception that a lot of people have that uh, the police, the, the officers, the fire, the, the, the safety officers that we have in our community, are, are, they're not like real people. They're not like people that actually live here. And, and so there's a perception in many people's minds that it's a, a us them kind of thing that these guys don't care about us. They don't live here when in fact, many of them live right here. Here we are. And it's, it's this idea of teamwork that we're in this together to make a difference. I, I I'm happy to be here and I'm, I'm just so happy that people can join in on this chat. They can listen. I've, I've talked to some people who are starting to view this and, you know, as time moves on, as the uh, as this plague goes away and we're able to gather in person safely, the, I, I believe that the plan is even to invite people to join us live in a building. Again, that's in the future, but I think the intent here is that we want to get to know people face to face when we can do it safely, but that we really are legitimately concerned. Is that not right, Sheep? Well, absolutely. So you, you hit on a couple of uh, really good points there. So. We do have a significant number of our, our officers and our staff that, that actually live in the community. And that's both sworn and professional. Um, you know, it, it's important to try to, when we bring in personnel and officers and, and staff into the, into the department, we really encourage them to, to, to be part of the community. Because, I mean, you will police the community better if you live in the community. Uh, you know, we know that. And, you know, we have a, we have a take home car program, uh, which if you live in a city, you can take your patrol car home. And that does a few things. It's an incentive for our, our personnel to live in the city, but it also provides us with the high visibility throughout the city. So, you know, when that patrol car is parked outside the residence, you know, it, it's good for that whole neighborhood and that whole area. So, you know, having people living in a community is, is, is great. And we really do encourage that, um, you know, we do want to expand this and then hopefully sometimes we'll be doing it more in person. Um, I think this is a great, a great addition to doing it in person because I don't want to lose this aspect because not everybody can make it. You know, they, they, they work different hours. They, they can't get off and get to a location, but you know, have this thing grow is, is important. And I also say that um, between, between five o'clock when I kind of got off work, and between six o'clock coming back to my office, uh, a lot of times I just sit here and, you know, finish up some paperwork. But today I was looking outside and it's like, it's gorgeous outside. So I took a ride around and I got, I was able to go to B Park and uh, the baseball park there on, on Southwest, Con, uh, Condone, Condone, I think, Park. And uh, I got to watch two little quick innings of baseball with, you know, with, uh, I think it was a 10, 11 year olds and then 11, 12 year olds and 12, 13 year olds. And you know, the stands were full, people out there enjoying the sunshine, enjoying watching the kids play, kids running around. Um, and it was, it was a phenomenal sight. 
I will say it's important though. We got to remember that we aren't out of this pandemic yet. Right. And, you know, it's important that we continue to mask and, and do our social distance. I know it's hard. We want to, we want to get up there, group up on the stand, but just kind of keep that in mind. Um, you know, I don't want to be hounding it, but, but we do, we definitely do want to remember to, to keep our masks on because, you know, it's as much for you as the other person is for you. So be safe out there, but uh, enjoy the sunshine, but let's keep following those rules. We'll, we'll get out of this. Exactly. Well, you know, we've been given permission in our churches to do in-house worship, but at Gateway, at Faith, where we're meeting on 7352 Boris Court, I'm going to get back to that in a second. There's a reason I mentioned it is uh, when we come together and we're, we're worshiping together, we're still practicing the safe protocols. Even though we've been given permission, we're keeping it about 50%. We can go 100, according to the Supreme Court. But we're taking steps because we love people and we want to continue to be safe. In fact, we even have a section outside where people can sit and, and, and really be safe, right? So, you know, everybody's first concern is let's be healthy, and let's be safe. And I, I think that safety factor really goes into the whole, the name of the department, safety officers, right? Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, as your point is, you know, I think when you're looking at the, you know, the Supreme Court making decisions and county health and state health making decisions, this is all new to people. So, you know, sometimes it's, just because we can doesn't always mean we should. So, you know, always kind of step back and say, yeah, you know, the church could be filled to 100%, but is that where we need it right now? Or, you know, the, the grocery store or whatever. So, you know, uh, just use really good judgment out there right now so we can get through this pandemic. We still have a lot of people who need to get vaccinated. And, you know, I would encourage, pe I would encourage people out there, if you, if you know somebody that, that is having trouble, jump in and help them out. You know, the city's trying to do, but we don't know everybody. You know who's on your street. You know your, your family members. And I think one of the places we're lagging right now in our vaccinations, and hopefully we'll start getting the, vaccination, the vaccines more, is, you know, people who are homebound and, and they don't have the advantages that we do of jumping in a car and getting someplace. And we need to get them vaccinated for their safety and for the community. So, you know, think about that and think about, okay, I'm vaccinated. How can I help somebody else get vaccinated? Right. You know, I think if each of us, you know, take somebody and, and, and make them, you know, our responsibility, we can, we can help move these vaccinations along uh, so that we can come out of this pandemic at some point and see some sense of normalcy come back. Right. And, and you know, most of us at least have a family bubble or you've got close friends in your bubble. And if you've got, especially what you, what, to your point, if you know somebody in your little bubble your safe zone bubble that can't get to be vaccinated on their own, offer to take them. You're already, you know, in that bubble. So you would be one of the safest options, way better than them wanting to get vaccinated and they can't get vaccinated because they're not able to do it. So, you know, there's actually something in the Bible about loving your neighbor as yourself. Reach out and do something good. Look, that's one of the things about Roner Park, the North Bay. When we've moved up here 24 years ago, and for me, it's still valid. This is a friendly place. I think it used to be known as the friendly city, right? Roner Park. And that's that's why we, we have that reputation here is that people reach out and help one another. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the, the signs are at the entrance of the city, the friendly city. Right. Uh, yeah, that's so, you know, taking care of each other is important. Um, you know, the, one of the things I do want to rem remind people why, and I don't know what what brought what caused me to think about this. I had it written down and I just looked at it, but, um, you know, when we're talking about safety. And this is uh, this is Distracted Drivers Month. April is always Distracted Drivers Month. Uh -huh. and, uh, and I have to say, uh, you know, I'm not I'm not always out there doing targeted traffic control because I can't. I don't have a marked car, but I I'm out there quite a bit moving from one place to another. And. Uh, I see a lot of people on their cell phones and, uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a pet peeve of mine because I know how many collisions we take that are associated with being on your cell phone or looking down at your cell phone. Um, so I'm going to just ask people to, Hey, when you get in the car, put your cell phone in, you know, in the glove compartment in the middle console, just do something. It, it, 
you know, it can't be that important to be on your cell phone. And I think where people have the biggest misconception is that when they come to a stop, a stoplight and it's red, that, that that is like, oh, okay, I can get my cell phone out and look at it because I'm on a red light. Absolutely not. You got to keep that thing off because when you're in that vehicle, when you're in control of that vehicle and in the lane, this, the citation is the same as whether you're driving down the road. So keep that cell phone out of reach. Put it somewhere where you're not going to, and if you do have to answer it, pull over in a parking lot, pull over the side of the road, talk all you want, talk for an hour. I don't care. But when you're going to control that vehicle back in the road, well, you got to put the cell phone away. We have too many, too, we're having too many collisions because of cell phone. Now, now just to be clear, so when, I, when I'm in the car and I drive up and I come to a red light or a stop sign and my phone beeped 30 seconds ago and I look down and I'm stopped, when I reach and grab that phone with my hand, I'm not texting, I'm only looking. Is that a go or is that a no? The, 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 it's a hands-free, right? We don't, want, we don't want the cell phone in your hand because if it's in your hand, then you're paying attention to it. And if you're looking at your cell phone, your attention is not focused on the driving and the control of that two or 3,000 pound vehicle, right? Uh, when you're in a car and you're in a lane, the cell phone does not need to be in your hand. It can't be in your hand. Well, um, that's, that's your point. That's the law. That's not your opinion. That's the law. That's where the citation comes in. If it's in your hand, you just you have just texted even though you didn't text. You've just used your phone even though you say you didn't. That's the point, right? Yeah, this, you know, we survived a long time before cell phones. Imagine that. I, I grew up <laughs> a time and didn't, you know, before cell phones were even here. So I know, I know that we could make a trip to the store or, or anywhere else without having to look at our cell phone because at one point we didn't have them. So, you know, just really just put them away. And I, and I will tell you that I encourage, um, you know, I, I, I just saw the chat and think of it, you know, I encourage the officers also you know, not to be on their cell phone. There is an exemption in the, in the vehicle code that when you're in on, on duty and you're in the performance of your job, um, because there are a lot of times that the officer will get information over the cell phone because we don't want it to go over the radio. I still want my officers pulling over or waiting till it's safe. I don't want them driving with their cell phones and they know that too. Um, and, and believe me, I get calls, and, you know, but um, you know, there is an ex exception in, in the vehicle for that but we don't encourage it. I can tell you that. Okay. Well, and, and the bottom line on that, the reason that you're trying to say, let's, let's live by this rule. It's the rule is there for everyone's safety. It goes back to that point of safety. How many times you get absent-minded and, and if you're not paying attention, that's when mistakes happen. So we, you know, when you're driving to the car, Remember this, you're driving the car. Stay focused on the job at hand. And if you remember something, oh my gosh, it's so much better to pull over and give it a call or give the attention. Uh, if you need to, I, I, this happened to me that, you know, we've chatted about this before. We chatted about this very point in the pastor's meeting that we have. And I would say, I think it was just a couple of days after that, I got, a, I, I usually have a hand uh, free kind of device in my car. But one of my cars doesn't have that. And I got a I got a ding. And guess what? I thought, I'll bet you chiefs in one of these unmarked cars right around me. I'm gonna pull into the parking lot, you know? And it's the reminder, Chief, if that that helped me. And I really hope and pray this reminder helps us all. Let's be safe. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I've got a couple of questions here, actually. Uh, one of the questions that uh, has come to my attention is that, the, you know, again, we're talking about people. We live here in Roner Park. And one of our community neighbors who lives in Roner Park, his house backs up to one of the paths that where the creeks are. And evidently, he's experienced some uh, break-ins there. What's being done to make that a safer place for people that live up against the creek? Is there anything that can happen there? Well, yeah. Uh, so one, you, you got to let us know, right? You got to, you got to call us, let us know you're having the issue or, or something happened. Let us get out there and, and look at it. There may be things that we can do just through, you know, like helping you uh, through, there's something called SEPTED, uh, crime prevention through in, environmental design, right? So there may be a way to look and, 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 and help you find ways to fix fencing or to make your yard more secure. We don't want anybody going in there, but sometimes we have to do things to make it secure. 
Uh, we are doing a lot of uh, patrolling on on the creek pass. Um, one of the things we've instituted recently is a officers are doing 30 minutes of foot patrol uh, per shift. And in different areas, uh, shopping centers, creek pass, neighborhoods. And so if you let us know, if you call us and let us know you're having that issue, you know, it, it helps the officers know where to do that dedicated foot patrol. You know, because right now they're, they just kind of, they get they park and they just do it. But if they know there's a problem, they can focus on it. Um, so, you know, don't ever hesitate to call. And, and, and please don't think you're bothering us if you call with something like that. We need to know what's going on and we need to know it's happening. Because a lot of times, you know, when little things happen and you don't report it, it they grow into bigger things, right? So if we can figure it out at the forefront and, and maybe figure out how to solve it, uh, makes it a lot easier on us and, and and we can be more effective but you know if you just call dispatch and say hey, can you have an officer out you know come over or we'll go over there and then that officer knows hey i'm gonna i'm gonna do my dedicated you know foot patrols here over the next couple of weeks see if i can't figure out who's who's coming through here and who might be breaking in you know getting in this person's jar so yeah um that's that's the best thing to do but you got to call us we if, if if we don't know we don't know right but, we don't know what we don't know is that I guess what we would say. Well, here's a question. How many safety officers do we have that are a part of the department here at Rona Park? So our full staffing is uh, 73 sworn um, public safety officers. Okay. And that, and that is between police and fire we have, you know, so okay. you don't have 73 out there at one time. And by the way, one of the things that's cool about the 73 officers are that all of them are cross-trained, right? Well, um, that in theory, uh, in theory. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so just for instance, we have six individuals right now. We have six people in the fire academy right now. Um, they, they, they completed the police academy probably about a year and a half ago, um, went through their field training, went through probation, and then we were able to get them. Now they're in the fire academy. So it, it, it takes two full academies to be a public safety officer. So in theory, everybody is cross-trained. Uh, you know, actually, we do have some officers who have completed the police academy portion of it and still are awaiting to do the fire academy. So, um, but I mean, we're probably at about 85, 87% of our staff is, is, is fully trained in both, especially okay. when I get picked up. Working on it, working on it. It's a, we're in process, right? It's a so work in process. Constant process, a constant process. Is and, and once they get trained, you're not done training. You really, you're, you have ongoing training because you want all of the officers to be the best they can be. Now, with the 73 or so, what, what would be the full complement? What would, what, what, do you have a target number of officers you'd like to have to have a full complement in your department? Well, you know, I'm sure the city manager is watching this. So <laughs> the correct answer is 73. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, I will tell you that I have never met a police chief or a fire chief who believe that the number of officers that they have is the number of officers they should have. Right. We always have 20 more, right? Right. Uh, but, you know, I, you know, policing a community is uh, part of it is the, is, is the community, right? And exactly, I, I could not, I could not police, you know, LA, parts of LA with 73 officers, right? No, it, it, you couldn't do it. But Roner Park is a much different city, right? Our crime rate is much lower. Um, we're able to, we're able to actually um, be proactive and police the community in a service-based manner, as a as opposed to a response-based manner to critical incidents all the time. So you know, seventy-three officers is 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 a good number for us. We have, you know, we have the two fire stations right now. Third one's coming online, but we have the two fire stations which are. You know, there's two at each station, 24 hours a day. And then we have a, a day shift, a swing shift, and a graveyard shift with cover units that come in periodic in, in between those during the day. So, 
you know, you can have a sergeant and three officers. And then two hours later, you could have a sergeant and five officers. And then there are times where there's the overlap, the day and swings, where you'll have two sergeants and eight officers. So, um, you know, at any, any given time, the number does diff, you know, change, but it, it, it is definitely sufficient to police a community at this time. I will say that as a community grows, you know, when you, you know, you can't, when you, you know, you, you got K section, which is building up, you got W section, which is building up. SOMO is going to be building up. You know, so as, as you add houses and homes and businesses and your population grows and the city stretches, you know, that's where you look and you think you, you try to figure out what do I need now to police that additional growth. But, you know, the city has done a great job at that. And, and um, you know, I know the city always wants to make sure that you know, public safety is important um, in the city and uh, they want to make sure that we have the personnel, the equipment training um, to police the community in, in, in the safest manner. So, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled that, you know, we have the personnel we do. And, uh, and I think that, that our staff does a great job of, of policing the community, community with the staffing we have. Now, we have officers, we have people that are doing some administrative support work. There's people on phones. There's a whole team of people. And, you know, knowing what I know about you guys, and, and what we've just said, I wanna make it clear, there are officers on duty, on patrol, and there are support staff, people on phones to get calls and, and help to uh, make sure that if, if a response is needed, they get where they need to go when they need to get there. And that is happening 24 seven every day of the year, right? Every day, we have- Every day. Every day, you know, we have a phenomenal dispatch center, um, phenomenal dispatchers. They are so dedicated um, to this job. There are, there are two and sometimes three dispatchers on duty. There's always at least two on duty, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year. Christmas, thanks, it doesn't matter. Doesn't um, matter. There. And, and our staff, the police side work every single day. I mean, there is always, there is always a sergeant and officers here, no matter what time of the day. And our fire crews, you know, they're, they're there, you know, it's inter I've, I've had to learn the, the fire side more, but, you know, they, they don't, just because their day ends at five o'clock, their day doesn't end at five o'clock. They are still on call. They go 24 hours and, uh, you know, they're getting, they're getting, you know, woken up at two in the morning, four in the morning, you know, they're responding to medical calls all night. There's not a moment in a day in a year, in a decade, that you can't call and someone won't answer the phone and, re and someone won't respond. That's why I say now, you're never bothering us. Never yeah, bothering us. You're here to serve, right? Protect and serve. Now, so approximately with that, with that team of dedicated professionals with ongoing training and that kind of commitment, how many people approximately live in Roner Park? Approximately. 42, 42,000, 42, Okay, really, but that, that's a round really, figure. I'm right? really curious to see the new census when it comes out, but yeah. And that doesn't even include all the extra people that are visiting uh, stuff and restaurants or uh, the, the casino or anything else that we have in town that people come to visit, right? So that the number of people here fluctuates a little bit, but here's my point. There is no way that our committed professional team of people have eyes to watch over 40,000 people, which brings me back to the point of we are each other's keeper. We are our brother's keeper and how important it is for us to have eyes looking out for our neighbors. Uh, I know one of the things that I've seen in the parking lot of our church, I'm going to go back to why I mentioned 7352 Boris Court, a couple of reasons. One of our neighbors to our church facility, as he uh, has apartment complexes, he's noticed that there have been activities at night that are a little shady, people doing drugs and things like that. Now, when, when our community sees things like that, which we don't want our kids to be involved with, we don't want anybody to be involved with that really. But when something like that happens, what should we do? Well, again, you, you gotta call us. You know, I, uh, as long as I've been in this profession, 
almost 31 years now, I, I have never believed that law enforcement is the, is the answer to every, we, we are, we are not gonna, we can't do our job without the community. I will tell you that. Yeah, we drive around and we see things, right? And you know, that happen right in front of us and we address them, right? But most people don't do things in front of us. When, when the patrol cars park there, you know, you don't have hand-to-hand uh, -hand drug deals. You don't have prostitution. You, you, don't, you don't have assaults. They don't happen in front of us, right? And so we have the training and the experience to go and, 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 and dig and investigate these crimes. But if we don't know about them, there's nothing we can do about them. And so, you know, we are only gonna be successful as a community in giving us information. So we depend on the community to provide us. You're our, you're our, you are our eyes and ears, you truly are. Um, and so, you know, when you have an issue like that, you gotta call us. We, once we know about it, once we get the information, then it's on us. Then it's on my staff to take that information and do something with it. But if, if you never call, I'm not going to know that this person doesn't live at this complex and doesn't belong there when I drive by and someone's sitting in a car or pulling in a driveway, right? If you call me and say, hey, that person does not live here. I think they're doing this. Now the, now the responsibility falls on us and our staff to do something about it. But you got to give us a chance. You got to give us the information we need to at least start looking and moving in that direction. So just call, just seriously, call, call me. I'll, I'll, I'll get the ball rolling. But Here's the thing. What I hope people are hearing from, from your heart is this is our city. It's our city. We live here. It's our community. Help us. Everybody, are you listening to this? Pick up on this. Help us make our community a safe place where we go to school, where our kids are growing up, where our kids can ride a bike safe, safely in the street and in your cul-de-sac. Help us. And the department is here to serve you. The department is here to help fulfill your desires to, to be a safe community. Uh, what I, I noticed in our parking lot at the church, 7352 Forest Corp, I walked outside this last week, and lo and behold, somebody had been doing donuts the evening before in our parking lot. Now, like you just said, they didn't do it in front of you. You know, a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times, they don't want to do it in front of a pastor either. Imagine that. But then at night, you see the, you see the results of, oh, look at those beautiful donuts. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm glad my car wasn't parked there because the donut's right where it was parked. But now, if you can see somebody doing donuts, call you, right? Don't call me. Don't call the pastor. Call the chief. Yes, or, or dispatch. But Dispatch uh, is good. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a story on that, um, that that's, that's been an issue uh, in, in the city. And it has been an issue here as it has in other cities. But we, we have our people who want to go out and I don't know. I, I can't afford to pay for tires like that. But. Nope. They want rubber on the road. And so, um, you know, we've been trying to deal with it. We've got some tools in place to deal with it. But since the officers have been have been doing their foot patrols, uh, we actually had an officer out doing foot patrols through one of the parks. Now, the advantage of that is they park their car in another location and they walk, right? And they can't get too far away from their car because if they have to respond, you know, they've got to be close enough. But the, they weren't in the car. So the, the person didn't see them in the car and didn't really notice them walking in the park and decided that they would um, do a little sideshow uh, in one of our intersections. And uh, the officer happened to be right there. And you know we were able, I, we were able to get that person and then we, we actually were able to get another one. So you know they, they are out there get, getting, getting these people, but that, that, that foot patrol getting out of the car is starting to really have an effect. Um, but again, if you have someone in your area who's doing that, if you're, they're doing those sideshows, I do not want you putting yourself in danger. Don't go out there and get involved with it. Call us. But if you have video from your house or you have phone video that can identify and, and we can get a plate, um, there are, there are things we can do. We may not be able to get the person, but we can get their car. 
So again, do not put yourself in harm's way. Do not, but if you happen to have a site show and you have video from your home that you would like to provide us, uh, we will follow up on it and, and, and we will take it from there. Everyone, we are eyes and ears. We are our brother's keepers, you know. We're, we're, we're trying to do the best we can to help each other. Now, one of the questions that just came in, uh, this came in from someone watching on Facebook, says, I would like to hear the chief's explanation of the parking on city streets law. I understand you may quote unquote park an RV on a public way for 72 hours. What is the law for someone residing in said mortar home on our neighborhood streets for months on end? Thank you for that question. Um, this is actually a question that came up quite a bit uh, in our early chats and um, it's still something we're dealing with on a, on a daily basis. So the, currently our, our law, the law and our ordinance, they allow somebody to park, park a vehicle, including a trailer or a motorhome on a city street for up to 72 hours before it has to be moved. Um, and we have code enforcement officers or uh, community service officers who that's pretty much one of the things they do is, is, is they address parking issues and, and vehicle uh, abatements. Um, and, you know, they're constantly tagging vehicles. Now, there are some that, that because if we drive by them every day, we go, oh, that thing hasn't moved. But most of them, we don't know if they've, how long they've been there. So we need, you know, if someone calls that, hey, there's been a trailer here parking, we'll one of the CSOs will go over and tag it. And then they go back in 72 hours to see if it's there. Most people will move them. Um, and some people move them around the block and then bring them back the next week. So it's kind of this uh, cat and mouse game we play with them. The the living in the vehicles is, is kind of a different, it's, it, it's, it's a more difficult problem to address um, because one of the things that the CSOs are looking for is they are, uh, they're looking for abandoned vehicles. They're, they remove abandoned vehicles, right? These are vehicles that someone has, has just left abandoned on the street. They don't have a motor in them, or you can tell someone just didn't want to dispose of them properly, so they've, they've abandoned them. Um, when you have a motor home that someone is living in, it's not abandoned, right? It's, it's, it's being used as a home. And right now what we're finding is, is we're finding that those are normally our unsheltered, our, our people who don't have a home, that, that is their home. And so COVID complicated that quite a bit because state health orders were telling us that we, we could not move these people along um, because you, know, we were, you didn't want to be moving people during the pandemic. Um, another thing is, is moving them along when we do not have a place for them to go, right? Um, so oftentimes we'll move them and, and they'll just move around the block and then they've got another 72 hours there. Um, so it is a problem. It is an issue that we're dealing with on a continual basis. Um, we do issue a lot of citations. Once the citation is issued, it becomes an issue with the uh, court, not us. Um, and so it, it's, I, I don't have, I mean, I don't have the great answer for this problem. It's, it's, it's a bigger problem. I will tell you that, that we are preparing um, to, to go to council with a discussion and direction item to talk about um, trailers, unattached, unattended trailers. That discussion may lead into also motorhomes because you know they do, they do cause an issue. You know, there's a weight issue on the road, there's vision obscurements on corners, um, there, there can be trash, hazardous materials. So there are problems associated with it. And, and so we're gonna be taking that to council, you know, probably I would say in the next few council meetings, I do know that, uh, to just try to get direction on where do we wanna go? Where, what, what kind of a parking program do we wanna implement in the city? And what are the costs of some of, the, of, of a parking program? Because it's, it's, a lot, it's, it's a lot harder than just passing an ordinance. If you're gonna pass an ordinance that addresses parking, you have to have a parking program. And if you have a parking program, that includes signage. And what does that signage mean? Is it at every entrance of the city? Is it at every intersection in the city? So these are things we have to start peeling back to figure out what level of parking do we wanna address? But for the person who wrote in, you, you are correct. 
we do have a we do have a lot of trailers parked on the roadway. I've said this in the past, um, and it's not. I'm not trying to be mean, but part of the problem is is that when people purchase a trailer, um, whether it's a, a pool behind trailer or a motorhome or or some kind of work trailer, they they are not thinking about the storage of that trailer, the proper storage of that trailer. And the, the, the roadway or the city street is not a proper place to store. But because people buy them and don't have the secondary plan of storage, they end up storing them on the street. And so we are trying to figure out a way to solve that. Um, if you ask 100 people, you'll get 50 people that say, I pay taxes and I should be able to park it on the street. You get another 50 who say, I pay taxes and I shouldn't have to have that thing parked on the street, right? So right. It, it, an interesting discussion, but you know, I hope people who are seeing this will actually get involved in the council meetings and give give input. Um, but but it is an issue. We are we're trying to address it, and we're we're working within the confines of the law to address it. Thank you very much. It's a very complex problem. Uh, another another comment about. There, there are some department stores that either give permission or don't give permission, but when people are driving around, they see people kind of camping out in the parking lots of some of the department stores, things like that. So is there an ordinance about that or is that one of those nebula, neb, nebulous things as well? Yeah, you, <laughs> I, I, I think I said uh, we play the cat and mouse game with, with something earlier and it's the same. Yeah. I, we so when they're on the city streets we push them off the city streets so you can't park here you can't be on the city street all right your registration's expired so you know we're going to give you a citation for that and, and you got to get it off the street so they don't have anywhere else to go so where do they go they go onto the target lot they go onto the burlington lot right they go onto the theater lot and then what happens is uh, code enforcement for the city now, because the the police the public safety department deals with what we call curb out. We deal with the stuff from the curb out into the street, right? So we're responsible for the city. Code enforcement for the city, pretty, they deal with curb in and and private property. So now once we push them off the street, they go onto the parking lot. Now code enforcement has to deal. They deal with the stores, and so. We, we start going after Target and Burlington and, and these, these places and say, you need to get them removed from the lot or we're gonna start, we have to cite you for this nuisance you're allowing. And they're not allowing it, they don't want it. I, I hope nobody in the city thinks that Target or Burlington or you know, the theater want motorhomes and encampments out in the parking lot, that, that's not. But you know, they go home at night, they come and there's three, three motorhomes in the parking lot the next morning, they can't just tow them off. I mean, they, they've got to work to get them off. And then they push them off the parking lots and where do they go? They go right back out in the streets. And then we push them off the streets, they go back. And, so it's just, it's just, just constant battle, pushing them back and forth. You know, We need to find a place for them. I mean, at some point we're gonna realize that the pushing them from the parking lot to the street and the street to the parking lot is just not working. But you know that's that's what we do. So yeah, they they end up in the parking lots, but it's just because we pushed them off the street. Um, it's a very complicated game of tag. Uh, yeah, hide and seek sometimes. Hide and you. seek. <laughs> so another comment. Someone is asking. Uh, they, they're curious if there's any uh, discussion about putting lights at the Adrian and Southwest intersection. Not in this department, not in public safety. That is something that I, I'm figuring they're talking about a traffic signal is what I'm figuring they're talking about. I, I, it wasn't specific. I'm not sure if it's street right. lamps or light or signal. It's probably, let's say it's a signal. Yeah. So, so all the traffic signals, um, anytime we want to put a, a stop sign uh, or a traffic signal in, those all go through our traffic, our engineering department. Um, there needs to be a study done. It's called a, a warrant. Um, they look to see how many collisions have been there, if there's been any injuries, um, and and then they they would then they would you know they would work on the public safety department to get that information. We work together, but those start at the engineering department. 
Yeah, see, um, that's very interesting that you say that because I have a feeling most people don't know that. Most people probably think the department sees this stuff and comes up with it. No, no, your enforcement, your crisis, you know, response. That's not that's not what you do. Who does it again? So it's it's the engineering department, and, and it's the city traffic engineer that would have the final decision. The public safety go. department does identify hazards, you know. And if we see if if we we've, we've taken you know several traffic collisions at a location, or we see you know uh, near misses, and, and we wow that. We can we can work with the traffic engineer to say, hey, we'd really like look look at getting a stop sign there or a stoplight there, but we would not be the ones who would initiate that or who would sign off on it. That does come from the, the engineering department. Okay. They have all, they have all the big plaques on the wall and nice. they call the number <laughs> and it will enforce it. Be beautiful. There again, it's a team effort. It's a team effort, and and you know again, some of the people if you see a certain intersection where there's issues going on, make it available, let, let put up a signal, right? Hey guys, what about this? Another uh, interesting question here. Uh, is there any way we could have more officers? It kind of goes back to your walking beat uh, uh, patrol you were talking about. This question is, can we have more officers in some of the shopping areas? So the uh, the city is, is currently divided up into three, three beats. We, we took the city and we segmented into three specific beat areas, locations, if you will. And that's based on calls for service, right? We, we try to even out the calls for service uh, so that the officers are, that the work, workload is kind of spread um, throughout the, the shifts. And so each officer is responsible for whatever shopping centers are in their beat. And like I said, you know, sometimes we have a sergeant and three officers on, you know, maybe early. Then we'll have a couple more people come in for cover shifts, so you'll have more. And so, you know, the 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 idea behind the walking beats and the getting out of your cars for thirty minutes was, you know, it, we want people. I want people out of their cars meeting meeting people, right? Walking through the neighborhood, getting to know people. Uh, but a lot of that came from we really need more presence in our shopping centers. We need officers walking through the shopping centers, right? Because um, to, to deter retail theft, to deter assaults, to deter burglaries and, and that. So, so we are, we are, that is what we're doing right now. That is one of the main reasons behind the mandatory 30 minute foot patrols is to get officers out of their cars, walking through those shopping centers. Um, so, you know, and I'm about, like I said, I'm about to get six people who are going to graduate the fire Academy in two weeks. Uh, they have finals next week. And in the following week is all the, uh, finishing and and some of the physical skills and then and then they're done get them back so i'll, I'll you you know we, we will see our staffing on the street even going up just just by getting those six people back out of the academy so yes yeah, that and 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 i am 100 in, in support we get we get as many people out there as we we can and and shopping centers are important it's a beautiful thing um safety through presence you know i mean it, it just salt doesn't do you a lot of good you, you know be careful with your salt but it works better when it's on your food right i mean it's doing its job and and just the contact of having officers visible there they are bad guys people that are doing shady things they don't like to see officers they look around to see that you're not there and when you are there it's there intentionally uh, and that that presence is such a welcome thing for the safety of our families and our children. It's it's awesome. So thank you for that question. That that was a great question. And and guess what? It's something you guys are actively working on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, high. You know, there there are studies that show that that high visibility lessens crime, right? And the more you can be out there driving around, um, and you know, that, that includes, that's just not Rona Park Expressway, you know, State Farm, Red, the, Commerce, Redwood, that, you know, those are important, but you got to get in through the neighborhoods. Yeah. You got to get to the shopping centers, um, you know, because, you know, you just think about it. Someone who I talk about all the time, in order, in order for a crime to happen, there has to be intent, mm -hmm. right, on the part of the person who wants to commit the crime. Someone has to have the intent to commit the crime, and there has to be opportunity. Those are the two things that that make crime happen: intent and opportunity. 
And I've always said, it's really difficult for me to have a lot of influence on the intent. If someone wakes up in the morning intent on going out and committing a crime, I'm not sure I have a lot of control over that. What we control is the opportunity. And so when we're out there and we're driving through a shopping center and someone is, you know, pulls into Rayleigh's or Safeway and they're, they're going to go in and commit that crime and they see a police officer, a cop go through, they're less likely to go through with it just because of the fact that now they know there's a cop in the area. Even though we turn the corner, they don't know if we left the area. They don't know if we're just on the other side. They don't know if we're coming back around, right? So, so being mobile and moving and, and having a high visible presence is a great crime deterrent, right? And then getting out and getting to know who you're serving, getting to know the people so they have a connection with you and they'll call you and they'll, they'll, they'll tell you things that they wouldn't tell you because they didn't trust you before or didn't know you, right? So all these things together is, is how we are gonna continue to get better at policing this community. And I love that word right there, better. It's great what's been done in the past, with the efforts and uh, the ordinances, all this, but guess what? Man, I love the commitment to get better. You know, keep training your guys as, as the community grows, get more coverage, you know, get the right coverage, get the right guys, get, that, that is just awesome. One, uh, another question that came in, uh, what would the average amount of calls be for a service on any one particular day? Oh man, I, I always say, don't hit me with statistical question. I, you know, it's hard to come up with them, but you know, I want to say that last year we took, I think dispatch took in about 32,000 calls. Um, you know, and not all of those resulted in a response, but in a, in a, in a day, I mean, from the time day shift hits the street to the time graveyards goes home the next day, 24 hour period. I mean, you're, you're talking about, I don't know, 40 or 50 calls for service where officers are actually responding mm -hmm. to calls. And that's not counting fire. You know, right. that's not you know, medical aids that, that generally an officer will respond to. Um, so, I mean, you know, they stay busy and then, you know, they have, they have other responsibilities such as report writing. You know, if they, every call they go to that, that they draw a case number, you know, that, that generates a report. And I, I want to say last year, we were up in the 4,000s in our case numbers. You know, that, that every one of those numbers required a written police report. You know, and sure, some of those police reports are, you know, a page, but some of them are 15 pages, right? So um, the, officers, the officers stay very busy. And, you know, I sometimes, you know, I haven't been on the street for a long time and, and I'll come down, I'll, I'll talk, to talk to them and find out, you know, they, they're, they got these reports and they did this. And I'm amazed at how much they get done in a day. They, they really do. Um, when, I was, when I was going through the academy and I wanted to be a police officer, uh, time management was not something I thought was part of police work. You know, you jump in your car and you chase bad guys. But, you know, time management is really a big part of, of this job in order to allow you to do the job right. Mm -hmm. If you don't manage your time right, you're not going to be able to serve. You're not going to be able to be, be highly visible. You're going to be, you know, you're going to be catching up all the time. And, you know, the officers do a great job of, of, of taking a report, getting it written so they can get back out in service and be visible and be driving around and be available. It, there's an interesting parallel that goes along with police work and ministry. You just said that, you know, when you, when you first were, uh, deciding you wanted to go into this career, you had this perception in your mind, you know, you get in a car, you chase back guy. A lot of people's perception about a pastor is, you know what, we, we, we get up, we preach a sermon on Sunday morning, and the rest of the time we do nothing, right? Or this perception that a police officer, you know, he's sitting in his car, he'll eat some donuts, and every once in a while he'll chase somebody down. Couldn't be further from the truth. You know, honestly, I, I know what some of you guys do, and there's no way you can get it all done. I mean, the work of an officer, uh, there's so much that goes on behind the scenes that not, and we haven't really got depth, uh, dug into be, when, being a fireman, fire, present, fire prevention. Uh, you've got 
crime prevention. We would much rather prevent crimes than have to, have to respond to crime, but you gotta do both, right? There's so much that goes into being an effective department and for an individual to be an effective police officer. Uh, but there's another great question that came in, and this is from Facebook. Is Roner Park planning in adopting a mental health crisis team like Santa Rosa is with their version of cahoots? Do you know any, do you have any word on that, Chief? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, I think, I don't know. I don't know where we are in, in, in can, you know, as opposed to where Santa Rosa is. I know we're both moving forward. Um, the, the cahoots model is an amazing model. You know, it, it, it started out in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, currently, it's being used in Eugene, Oregon and Springfield. Um, it's been in place up there since the early 80s. Uh, you know, and it, it actually started, it actually started uh, based on a, a shelter. The White Bird Shelter up in Oregon started this, uh, this idea of, hey, let's have people, instead of just waiting for them to come to us, let's go out and help people. Let's go out and, and take crisis workers into the street, right? And they built on this. It's a great model. And so, uh, you know, we're currently um, we're currently in the process of, of working with a consultant to get that model brought right here, um, and we're I'm excited about it. I this is one of the the, the biggest things that I I I think I've seen come here in a while um, is to be able to put a van in our community with an EMT and a crisis worker to address these calls, to address these mental health calls, to address these check the welfare calls, to address some of the issues that we're dealing with the homeless, right? And it's, you know, we haven't got the process all lined out yet. We, you know, we're looking at trying to maybe have, you know, it looks like maybe seven days a week, 12 hours a day to start. So there's a lot of things to iron out, but we're, we're right in step with Santa Rosa and what they're doing, Petaluma and what they're doing. We're all doing the same thing. Um, and we're all, I can tell you that we are all excited about it because as amazing as my staff is from, from the dispatch records, public safety officers, we have not gone to school for years on end to be mobile cri mental crisis workers, right? We have, we have training and we try to get more training, but it's not, it's not our expertise and to think that we're coming up with a process that we are gonna actually send the right people. We're gonna have a process to send the right people to the right calls, right? Um, it is, is so exciting, right? And it's gonna take, it's gonna then actually allow our officers to have more of that time to be proactive and, and visible and get and interact with the community. Because I will tell you that even, you know, I always say, yeah, you get in this to, to, to chase bad guys and take people to jail. That's part of the job, you know, but you know, the most satisfying part of this job, it, it's, it's the people, it's meeting the people and getting to know the people. And I think I said at the beginning of this, that I took, I, I ran out of my office just to get some fresh air. And I was able to go to a couple of little baseball parks and watch an inning or two of baseball. That was the best part of my day. Best part of my day of getting out there and just getting to talk to the people in the stands, talk to the kids who are playing ball. Um, that no matter what else went on in my day to day, the staff reports I was writing, the meetings I was on, that is that that's the best part of any officer's day is the is being able to deal with the community and be part of the community and get to know the community. Yes, we'll do the other stuff. That's part of the job, but you know, and so that's why this this cahoots model that we're looking at is so exciting. You know, right now we have, you know, we have fire, we have police, we have the EMS. Right, those are our kind of our three response models. And we're gonna add a fourth response model to this, which, which is, is awesome. You know, we talk about putting more tools in the toolbox, right? That's what we're doing. And um, someone said it the other day, and they took the words right out of my mouth, but you know, if, if you're sending people, if you're, if you're trying to handle calls and, and the only thing you got to handle that call is, is a hammer, every call is gonna look like a nail, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's right. and, and so, you know, being able to, 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 to develop a model, an, an alternate response model to handle those calls is, is, is awesome. So thank you for asking that question. And we are, we are moving there. We are in lockstep with, uh, with Santa Rosa. I don't know who will have the van first, but um, 
I guarantee whoever whoever does the other, the next will have it right right after that. So that's uh, awesome. I, you know, I've been on some of those calls we're talking about. Uh, years ago, I was a chaplain. I, I've been on with police officers. I've just been on and as the faith community that's here in Rotor Park. We get these kind of calls fairly frequently as well, where a family doesn't know what to do. It's one of their kids. It's one of their, you know, it's, it's a family member often or a, a friend of a family members. And what do you do? And, you know, so you guys, you go in with your training, but it's like, you're not the right fit. And then we go in with our training. We don't have, what, I mean, it, to have a, an organization that trains people specifically the right fit for the right situation. Wow. And we talked about this last week, way before this question came up. I mean, this thing is in process. It's, it's a commitment because we have a commitment here in Roner Park to make us a safe place. It is awesome. Coming soon. Yeah. Um, oh, by so the way, here's another great question. Uh, uh, someone says, hey, uh, is it possible? Would, it be, would you guys be willing to have an, off, an officer go live on social media with a virtual ride along on some of these calls to see so that as residences, we can see how truly awesome your officers are? We're talking about it, but could you get a virtual ride? I don't know. That's, a, that's funny because I just all I saw was the last part of that when it came across. I thought someone was asking about ride alongs. And I was going to say, yeah, as soon as, as soon as this pandemic lets up, we definitely will do ride alongs. But but that's why I love these chats because because you y'all are smarter than me because I didn't think about <laughs> a ride along. But what a great idea! What a great and idea! It feels like oh my gosh, I know what the chief's going to want me to start doing tomorrow. <laughs> but yeah, that's a great idea. Um, there have been a couple things that came up on this chat that we're actually working through right now to try to try to get because they were they were ideas that came up here and. Um, yeah, and then and then there was one other I saw come in here about do the Chiefs. What was that one, Randy? Did you see that come in? Do the Sometimes. Chiefs have local regular meetings similar to how the Sonoma County mayors do? Ah, uh, yeah, the mayors were copying us. What are you talking about? There you go. So the the um, Sonoma County Chiefs Association, it's the it's the leaders of all every law enforcement uh, office in the, in the in the county. So we have the DA there, we have the sheriff. Uh, head of probation um we have uh then we have associate meetings but then all the chiefs and yes we meet monthly um we have uh, some protocols countywide protocols that we put together um and we do it so that we can be consistent in in how we deliver law enforcement services we also have a county fire chiefs group which is another the other group that i that i attend and we do the same thing every fire chief in the and the county is part of it, and we meet monthly um, to discuss all fire issues, and 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 again, so we can remain consistent in how we deliver fire services to the to the our, all of our people. So yes, there you great go. question. Yep. So there's another little tag along with the idea of a virtual ride along, and this obviously can't happen until things are safe because you know we've gotten through the COVID. But when when it is safe, when we've kind of gotten beyond that, then the question is. What about a citizen ride along? I think that would give a lot of Roner Park citizens a whole different perspective or appreciation for what these guys do. So we have a program here in Roner Park and it's been here forever. It's, it's, it's our ride along program. Mm -hmm. And um, you can ride along, 18 or over, you can ride along. And I believe 16 or over, you just need permission of signature from your parents. Um, and there's a process to it. And we just had to cut them off when the pandemic hit, right. but we, we can't wait to get our ride alongs going. Uh, yep. Again, we we love when the community wants to come out and see what's going on and look at it through the front window of a police car. Um, we encourage it. So I promise you that as soon as the pandemic lets up and we can get those going again, uh, we'll still be doing these chats and I will let you know we will we will blast it everywhere that ride alongs are still awesome. Uh, so, yeah. yes. All right. Well, I think we did it. <laughs> we did it. So again, I just want to thank everybody who gave up an hour of the day to listen listen to me talk and Randy talk today. Um, and you know, in the past we've had, I think I had a question one time about, hey, how can how can I host one of these things? You got my email there. Um, you know, feel free to if you're serious and you you'd like to host one of these chats, please email me. And uh, you know, there's there there's no I'm I'm. I'm, I'm chatting with anybody, right? So 
um, just let me know and um, and we'll move forward. But again, thank you again for giving up the time to, to sit here and listen to me tonight. And I hope you stay safe. Um, have a great rest of the evening. Have a really good week. And uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you, Chief. Thank you all of the department for making Roner Park a safe place. Hey, citizens, let's all join them. Let's keep our eyes open. And we live in the friendly and the wonderful place of Roner Park. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. See you later.